Good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you to the Heartland Institute. Welcome you to the Andrew Breitbart Freedom Center. For those of you, most of you know who we are, but for those of you who don't, we are a 33-year-old think tank. We're a national think tank, but we do things a little differently here in that we work on state policy mostly in all 50 states. So just want to remind people of that. Over here on the left is a lot of our literature. And in fact, our newspapers are here. We cover constitution reform, which doesn't have a newspaper, but our other topics, environment and climate, budget and tax news, healthcare news, and the most important, in my opinion, is school reform news, because if we don't fix the education system, we're never fixing anything else. Tonight, we're discussing healthcare, though. So first thing I want to do here is introduce Matthew Glantz. He is our senior policy analyst, and he's going to come tell you what our government relations team is doing right now. Good evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Glanz. I am the senior policy analyst for the Hartman Institute, working in our government relations department. As uh, Lane mentioned, Hartman is a very unique organization that we focus mainly on state issues. And the government relations team is the means by which we work with state legislators. On a daily basis, we talk to anywhere from <laughs> dozens of legislators over, over, a, over a month. We uh, coordinate them with uh, what the issues are happening in their states, um, like what, uh, what legislation is being, being proposed. Um, what efforts they need, need, they need help with over the, uh, over the sessions, and we provide uh, testimony, uh, direct uh, writing response to their, their issues, and basically we are their go-to person on any issue that falls within our main policy areas, which include budget and tax, health care, education, environment, and now constitutional reform. In the last month alone, we've, we've actually done a lot of good, even with uh, most sessions on the, on the wave of uh, sh shutting down. Uh, in August, Jesse Hathaway, the managing editor of Budget and Tax News, testified in Missouri on the prevailing wage laws. I myself worked with the legislator in, in uh, Indiana on uh, costs of living adjustments and how uh, the state is looking to kind of roll them back in that state, which is a very good development and given that most states are heavily burdened by their heavy pension deficits. Also, we are now working with a Pennsylvania le legislator on a big education bill that should be proposed sometime next month. In November, the GR team will hold our largest event, the Emerging Issues Forum. EIF, as it's known as, brings together state legislators from across the country to discuss issues such as health care, education, budget and tax, energy and environment, and consciousness reform. And basically the goal is to find the big emerging issues of next year and kind of build a game plan of how states are going to pursue a free market approach to these issues. We currently have 40 legislators all are registered for the event, representing 20 states. Since we're a few months away, we're well ahead of the curve, which is uh, excellent for the event. Right now in healthcare, the GR team is working very closely on what we consider to be one of the big policy issues of, of this year, which is healthcare. With the failure of, the, uh, of Congress to, in any way, repeal, reform, or change the Affordable Care Act, we believe the states can and should play a very important role and reforming health care policies in their states. We believe there are three main branch, uh, three main attacks that uh, the states can take to effectively reform health care in our states. The first and most important is a waiver process. There are two main waivers that states can use to affect health care reform in their states. The first is 1115s, which allow them to propose changes to the Med their Medicaid programs. The second is our 1332 waivers, which allow the state to make somewhat substantial changes to their uh, Affordable Care Act cha exchanges. The problem is, uh, right before the Obama administration left office, they added quite a few what they call guardrails to those waivers, making it a lot more difficult to create real reform. But there's, we still believe there are still niches inside this waiver process that allow real reform to happen. Second, within the states, states are <laughs> bound by their own myriad morass of regulations. Um, and we believe there are several areas of opportunity within these states where you can see real reform. Uh, for example, you, you could look at issues like allowing dental therapists to provide more services. Right now, uh, dentists are, <laughs> dental therapists are held back by extremely stringent uh, regulations allowing, stopping them from providing the services they had the training for but aren't allowed to fully use. In states around across the country, you have areas with dramatic shortages of dental, dental care services. This allow, would allow a, a very more 
open, op allowing a more open certification standard will allow people to receive his services and just hopefully improve care for thousands. Also, uh, <laughs> in my opinion, one of the most uh, command and control functions of the government is uh, process no certificate of need, where the government has to explicitly allow a hospital to enter a market, often giving competitors say during that process. If you were to remove that one barrier, you'd see a explosion of new healthcare services on the, on the market uh, everywhere across the country. So <laughs> that's one of our biggest targets for going on years now. And lastly, we believe states themselves with their own health care programs for their own employees can serve as a test bed for these different uh, reforms. For example, in Indiana, uh, they reformed their system to allow increased use of HSAs, health savings accounts for state employees, and it being very, success very successful. We hope to uh, point out that states can use these test beds as a, way, as a proving ground for these concepts, and we hope to do more of that over the next year. And that's uh, about it for my little uh, review here. Um, I thank you for coming today. I hope you enjoy the event. I encourage you to learn more about the government relations team's efforts at heartland.org. You can always remember, go to our website, heartland.org, and find any information, all of the studies, everything Matt writes is on our website, actually with PolicyBot. I believe there's over 30,000 articles there now and research studies that you can come find on Heartland and Heartland because we're sharing helping other people spread the message of free market ideals and stuff as well. So we make it try to make it very easy for you to find the information you need and you can always email any of us here. All of our email addresses are, are online on heartland.org. You can find us all. So before we start real quick, have one other quick announcement. If you didn't get your postcard, we, I know we have some flyers on your tables about our Picnic for Freedom coming up September 9th. So, I want to, so hopefully we'll see everybody you back here. Come to hear Tim Hulskamp, our new president. And we have Joe sitting here tonight, our CEO. He finally wants to, wants to retire and actually do some traveling along with Diane. I'm sure Diane probably wants to be doing a lot more traveling. <laughs> and she's tired of reading all of our writing. I can't pretty much bet on it. <laughs> In the back of the room, our speaker tonight, Dave Racer, has two small books along with the other book. But the books are $3.50 each, or if you want a copy of both, they're $5. So they're right in the back. So I will leave them up here for Dave. But tonight, we're going to talk about Passion for Patients. And this is a book Dave has written or edited, I think, like 18 healthcare books and almost 50 now total books. So. He's probably not, he doesn't look old enough to write that many books, so he's been very prolific in writing. <laughs> so Dave also is from Minnesota. He has come down. He is a teacher, a talk show host. He's done tons of stuff, entrepreneur, a whole lot of stuff in his life, and I'm sure he'll be talking a little bit about that, but I think the main question he's going to answer tonight is, where should the focus of healthcare be? And is, is it coming from government? Should we be focusing on insurance, or should we be focusing on patients? So at this time, I'll welcome Dave to the stage. It's incredible to be here uh, after spending two weeks in Europe and uh, getting to Oxford and all those wonderful places to uh, come back to the United States and talk about a subject that I have a lot of passion for. Uh, it's an amazing thing to be involved in the United States in policy debates. And I like what Heartland does because you're involved in a broad array. Healthcare is not really a carved out niche. When I started working in healthcare policy, I had already been teaching American government for quite some time. Uh, I had been uh, uh, the head of the Constitution Educational Foundation. I helped found the Declaration Foundation. That was my niche and all of a sudden, I get a call saying, what are you doing now? I said, I'm writing books. Well, I want to write a book about health care. This is 2004 because everybody knows Hillary's going to be president and we've got to get ready for this. And so we wrote a book called Your Health Matters along with Greg Dottillo, who is an insurance agent from the Twin Cities. And since then, I've been focusing so much on health care. My friends who are in the shall I say, patriot movement or, you know, the founding principles that think those are, you know, the primary things that, what are you doing wasting your time with healthcare? Well, I got to tell you, they are intimately, intimately related. 
the problems that we're suffering in the United States uh, with policy in general, uh, with our confusion about who we are as a people and what we really believe, and how they motivate us uh, to carry out our lives, or don't motivate us, are critical. They're critical and they're related across the issues, they're related across our view of the Constitution and the Declaration and law and statutes and faith and all the things that are so important to our country and they all apply to health care. And we get it wrong in those dimensions, we'll get it wrong in health care. And we're getting it wrong across all those dimensions. And that is a, that is a serious challenge. In, uh, on Christmas Eve 2012, I was on the treadmill in my house and suddenly I had a sensation. It went like this up my head, cross, my ears plugged off, and I got a headache. I thought, what is this? And I went upstairs and I picked up my phone, my cell phone, I called Dr. Don Gehrig, who is my private doctor, who I pay cash to, not in an insurance system. And I told him what was going on and he said, is your wife sitting next to you? And I said, yes, she is. Have her take you immediately to the emergency room and tell them that you're having a brain bleed. And, uh, and that's what we did, 11 days in ICU, 15 days in the hospital, and I walked out uh, healthier than I went in. And uh, when Dr. Gehrig came to see me, I remember saying to him, sir, you saved my life, and I will never forget that. One of the reasons he could do that is because we had an intimate, professional relationship. Now, Dr. Gehrig also is passionate about not just patients, but about liberty and freedom. And so we had many, many talks about that. In fact, we had talks about that before he became my doctor. That was one reason I chose to make him my doctor. Even though I'm a Medicare patient, I've chosen to go to this doctor, this cash payment, direct pay, independent practice doctor for that specific reason, that I have a passionate professional relationship with my physician that is not interfered with by any third party. And it isn't that he's not free from government regulation because nobody's free from government regulation in the United States. Along the way, we met a fellow, I met a fellow named Lee Beecher. Lee Beecher was a psychiatrist, started his education in 1961, practiced all during the period of healthcare reform, starting with Medicare, Medicaid, you know, HMO reform, uh, managed care, you name it, he saw it. And in 2004, he decided to go to a cash practice as a psychiatrist, which he did for the ta last 10 years of his practice. I had the immense uh, pleasure. Well, I, let me back up just a little bit. Most of my work on healthcare had been in the insurance side, the finance side. And I spoke to insurance agents all over the country, and I learned a lot about the healthcare finance side, how we pay for things. And I had opinions about the provider, and I don't even like the word provider, Please forgive me, doctors who are watching this. The physician side, uh, I had opinions, and I heard agents have opinions, and sometimes they weren't the best opinions. Uh, there were charges of, you know, uh, overcharging or unnecessary procedures and all of this. Anyway, um, I became really convinced that, that there were three groups who really needed to start talking to each other, and that's physicians who practice, agents who practice, and employers who employ people on the floor. And they needed to get it together to understand. And so Dr. Beecher asked me uh, one day if I would talk with him every week for two, two hours on a Friday. We did that for 28 weeks, 28 months, excuse me, 28 months, every Friday. And that's how this book came out, uh, Passion for Patients. We talked about every aspect of healthcare you can imagine, from the intimacy of a, a doctor and a patient to how they pay for things, to the interference by government, third party payers, and everything else, and put that all on top of all the things I had learned about healthcare finance and the other books that I had written with other fine people. And that's what produced passion for patients. Um, I'm pretty proud of it. Now, you all remember this great quote from Nancy Pelosi. We had to pass the bill to find out what's in, what was in it. Well, <laughs> a doctor said, that's the definition of a stool sample. <laughs> and uh, I think it's quite apt. But uh, I, I'm kind of tired of talking about the ACA. How about you? I mean, we could spend forever on that. And, uh, and it's boring and frustrating and 
what we really want to talk about is uh, whether we can find ways to redesign medical care. And you notice I used two different words there. I didn't say health care and I didn't say reform. I said redesign because it needs to be redesigned. And I said medical care because nobody knows what health care is. <laughs> health care is one of those huge. So we actually write about medical care and mental health care in this book. You'll hardly ever use a C or see us use the word health care uh, for that reason. Everybody is talking today about patient-centered health care. Please, please understand what they're really saying because they're not saying patient-centered health care. They're saying that big insurance, uh, I got a whole bunch of these surrounding it, big pharma, big data, and really big government will all converge somehow to improve the lives of the patient. So I was talking with someone earlier tonight about the way that we, we identify a problem and then we turn to government to solve it. And government creates a bigger problem by creating its bureaucracies. And the CBO report of 2008 that set the tone for healthcare reform talked about the cost of government imposition in healthcare. And I've sort of lost the number. It's significant, as you can imagine. We're talking about Medicare, Medicaid, and all those programs. But the CBO report also said that there were at least eight other federal government departments that had their fingers into health care, and those costs had not been calculated in coming up with the CBO report. Well, that's just the federal government. And you know how intertwined big government is with all of this. The, the saddest thing about it, though, uh, in my opinion, is not, you know, we could say uh, uh, we still have local health care, we still have state-based health care and, and all of that. We do to some extent. But what the ACA really did was federalize health care policy making or medical care policy making and put so many roadblocks in the way uh, and curbs, if you will, and ruts and so forth that it makes it almost impossible to back up. Uh, I'm going to tell a story. We use the term stakeholder syndrome in this book. And I think I penned that. I think, you know, probably not. I probably picked it up from Joe Bass, but I don't remember. Uh, stakeholder syndrome is this thing where, you know, you're just a person going along, then you get into a program. You're in Medicare. Somebody threatens Medicare. Wait a minute. I believe in liberty. I believe in original intent. I believe in the Constitution, but don't touch my Medicare, right? And, uh, and I tell a story about a, a friend agent of mine, insurance agent in western Texas, I will never say the person's name, who uh, two months after the Affordable Care Act kicked in, had been selling um, independent or individual health insurance plans off the exchange. And had told me at that time he had 700 clients. And it generated about, well, that month, $6,000 in uh, commissions. And I went, oh, man. This guy's going to make $100,000 in new commissions. He's going to pay a dear price for it. Believe me. He's going to sell his soul. <laughs> He's going to sell his time. He's going to work, to the, you know, work himself to death to do it. But I felt really bad about that because now uh, we go back to these same people who have really good principles and belief in government, but they're ingrained in the system. They have a stake in the system now. And so it makes it much more difficult to back the policy up. And that's one of the challenges. And it's not... I'm not picking on agents, I'm just saying this is, in, this is part of the insidious nature of federalizing health care that's created all these stakeholders. And one of them is not the guy in the middle. It's not the patient. Always missing in the debate, always missing in the debate are these three uh, entities. First of all, the doctor who actually sees patients who doesn't have time to run down and testify but has an opinion, believe me, all doctors have opinions about health care and how it should be carried out. Secondly, our employers, especially small employers, who actually walk the floor with their employees and probably buy the same health plan as their employees and are struggling to keep things together. And they have ideas about how to improve health care. And I don't necessarily say agents are in the middle of this, but I am, a, I am an agent advocate. Uh, I've been called that in Minnesota, the, the agent's advocate, because this is an army of people who understand healthcare finance like nobody else. And they talk to thousands and thousands and thousands of people 
and I want them to talk to people about good policy, good principles, liberty, and all the things that are really, really important, and not just health insurance. <laughs> and so I have always had this feeling, well, at least since 2007 when Mr. Dottillo and I were writing together, uh, that we need to have some sort of a coordination where we don't go to the academic pinheads, as we call them, and the politicians and the insurance company executives and the folks at Pharma and say, fix this for us. We go to the people who actually are engaged in healthcare every day in every way and say, what do we have to do to get these things out of the way so we can do our job so we, everybody can have health care like Dave Racer did with Dr. Don Gehrig and all have the same passion for patients. That's what this book is really about, is trying to focus on that. There we go. Healthcare is called a complex economic system. I know there's an economist here in the office, audience, maybe many economists. Uh, a complex economic system, it says, uh, sees the economy not as a system in equilibrium. It doesn't look like that fun, pleasant lake there. It's more like this. It's in motion, perpetually changing, with hundreds and thousands and even billions of transactions going on at all times. This is what the healthcare economy is like. It cannot be put into a box where you can turn dials and push buttons and make things work the way you want them to work. Another complex economic system is our food distribution system. When you think of that warehouse of food and somehow it gets right on time to a grocery store where a homemaker uh, can go shopping and pick up what he or she wants. And the first thing she says is, what do I want to buy? Right? What do I want to buy today? And the second thing is, how much does it cost? What if we bought health care that way? Would that not be remarkable? What if we could? What if we did? Patient-centered health care is health care that brings these two entities together a doctor and a patient. I've been warned that this clicker was a little slow, so you just have to stick with me. Uh, brings the patient and doctor together in this intimate professional relationship that I described to you earlier. Uh, and I'm looking for a system then for reforms for medical, medical system redesign, if you will, that will create this question between a patient and a doctor. Not a system saying, this is what you have to do under this circumstance. If the blood test says this, and if the blood pressure says this, and this is that, and this is, this is what you do. And the patient says, oh, all right, send me on to the next doctor. No, we can't do that, because that's not authorized. First, we're going to do this and that. OK, I want the situation where the patient says, why do I need this? And more importantly, what does it cost? Dr. Mike Ainsley is uh, one of the directors of Minnesota Physician Patient Alliance. Uh, Dr. Beecher is the president. I'm on the board there. Minnesota Physician Patient Alliance. And we just, we use this quote throughout the book, <laughs> okay? And the quote is, just give the patient the money and get out of the way. Just give the patient the money and get out of the way and design a system where folks are in charge of at least a portion of their, uh, insure, of their uh, payment for medical care. So we create a professional relationship between a patient and a physician where both the patient and the physician have skin in the game. What is wrong with a doctor risking his or her practice every day like the guy who owns the sheet metal shop or the grocery store or practices law or sells insurance? and not to have this security of an accountable care organization wrapping its arms around that says, if you work enough hours a week and if you deny enough tests, we will pay you a huge amount of money and we'll give you a bonus at the end. But if you prescribe too many things, we're going to claw it back, and so you better pay attention to how we're doing it. No, that is not the way to reform health care. One thing we have to understand is every patient is different. Every need is different. <laughs> I asked a friend of mine who was studying psychiatry once why I didn't have an ulcer because I was so stressed out most of the time. He says, because you laugh a lot. Well, not everybody laughs a lot, you know. 
<laughs> a lot of people are grumpy and they get full of ulcers and then they get cancer and all sorts of horrible things. We're all different. In uh, 2014, 2012 was my brain bleed. 2014, I had uh, prostate cancer. Isn't that lovely? And then I, I woke up 2016 and I said, well, I wonder what will happen this year. <laughs> I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, every patient is different and so are their needs. Just when you think you've got it figured out, something happens. So Dr. Don Gehrig, late in 2015, said, come in for your physical. It's $305. I said, I can risk that. And uh, he did some tests. He called me up. He said, you've got a problem. I said, what's that, doctor? He said, your creatinine level is going up. I said, oh, that's dandy. What does that mean? And uh, he explained to me that it could be the onset of kidney disease. And something was going on, and, and he, now I, again, cash pay doctor, I'm in the Medicare system, arranges for all the people I need to see, gets all the tests lined up for me in the right order so we don't waste money, and we find out, lo and behold, my left kidney is two centimeters smaller than my right kidney because it's not getting any blood. So June 8, 19, or 2016, I get a stent inserted to open up the blood flow to my kidneys so I don't have to have kidney dialysis or lose a kidney later on. Is that cool or what? That's the way doctoring should be done. That was June 8th and then something happened that I couldn't predict. <laughs> July 9th, one month and one day later, driving down the freeway in Minneapolis, the car in front stopped dead. So did two others in front. They hit each other. We hit the last one. And uh, then I had a deep chest contusion. <laughs> so uh, I no longer ask, I wonder what will happen this year. Uh, I just know something will because I'll be 70 on Saturday, Lord willing, and stuff happens, right? Okay, so, but it's different with everybody. And physicians are different. We think that we could put physicians in this little box. Well, we have the forensic pathologist, the pathologist who all they ever see of a human being is a piece of material, a slide, a, you know, some blood or something. It's all they ever see. They never ever talk to a human being except other pathologists. They're, they're a little unusual people. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my original mentor was a path pathologist, by the way, he's an incredible writer, uh, Dr. Richard Reese, uh, who is now in his late age, uh, in the late 80s. And, uh, Hartford, but um, I learned so much from him. But his world is so different from Dr. Beecher's. Dr. Beecher had a, a professional relationship with a patient named Joyce for over 40 years. He had to go to cash pay eventually just to take care of Joyce because there was no insurance system that would help her and she still needed help. Most of his patients were two or three visits and everything was cool. Sometimes there was a long-term one. We talked about a lot of those uh, unique cases. But um, 40 years. So we can't say for physicians, here's how to practice. Here's the box to put it in. Here's all the data. Here's the metadata. This is what you do because we don't cooperate. We have pathologies that just don't fit. And so, oh, I got past that one a little fast. That was Maslow's hierarchy. Well, there's an IT hierarchy. I got to touch a little bit on big data. I came across this chart. And it's pretty interesting. I don't think the people that are going to watch the video are going to necessarily be able to see this. But it's a, like a hierarchy of needs. And you start with collecting a lot of data, and it filters on up to eventually where we get artificial intelligence and what they call deep learning. The goal is to create an individual medical record. This is not an electronic health record. This goes way beyond, which takes metadata, billions of people, pieces of data, and then uh, strides it and calculates it and puts it into various kinds of groups and then puts your uh, blood and your DNA into it and da 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 and wearable devices and pretty soon you'll come up with your own individual medical record that says this is how to treat Dave Racer whenever he has a problem. As long as it's predictable and he doesn't run into a car on a freeway, we'll be in real good shape, maybe if they get the data right. Uh, but that's where big data is going. Is big data wrong, bad? No, it's an information source that can be used for good purposes. When I got out of the hospital after my prostatectomy, <laughs> Dr. Gehrig waited two days to call and tell me this. He said, I got your discharge papers. 
I said, oh, so? He said, 20 and a half pages, David. I used to get three paragraphs. Who is going to use all this information? The doctor who has been practicing like he has all these years doesn't need all that information. It's in the way. It's in the way. Doesn't mean that it isn't good. It means that it cannot be primary. Uh, it cannot be a directive that affects decisions at the bedside. It can't be a guide for federal lawmaking and regulations, which it is, and it cannot be a way to decide how to pay doctors. Now remember Watson. Watson, the IBM computer. Watson can count, but he can't Bob love. Dylan, to improve my language skills, I've read all your lyrics. You've read all of my lyrics. I can read 800 million pages per second. That's fast. My analysis shows your major themes are that time passes and love fades. Well, that sounds about right. I have never known love. Maybe we should write a song together. I can sing. You can sing? Do be bop, be bop a do. Do be do be do. Do, do, do be do. Dr. Beecher loved that commercial. We put it in the book. We put a few others in there too because of the message. The message is that Watson is going to be able to replace the doctor someday. And, uh, and this is what we said, physicians fear the day when Watson becomes the chief of medicine. But you think about it, the human heartbeat has so many nuances. The experienced doctor can tell not just by counting but by hearing what's going on in there hundreds of different nuances that will tell him what's really going on in the human body. Now, some doctors believe someday Watson will be able to figure out all those nuances. I'm not so sure. I would like to have an experienced doctor in a professional relationship listening to my heart and having the confidence to know what he's hearing. But I told you about Joyce. Now, you just saw what happened with <laughs> this experience with Bob Dylan and Watson. So we wrote this little thing about Joyce. Good day, Joyce. You look worried and your biological feedback data from your smartphone is out of the range of acceptable norms, says Watson. I'm quite worried. I have uh, trouble sitting still, concentrating, and I've been arguing with my sons a lot, opines Joyce. And uh, yes, I know your app told me about your pulse rate, blood pressure, and blood chemistry, even the pH level of your sweat. Your integrated medical record predicted you would be unhappy today, says Watson. Did it tell you how to re relieve my anxiety? Well, I've combined your genomic data with your electronic health record and integrated the data from your wearables and apps and then uh, compared it to 2.7 million others across the world who have similar or nearly identical markers. I can hear your heartbeat and see it's 91 beats per minute too high. And, and the data tells me it's no surprise you're upset and anx anxious. <laughs> it also explains why you recently purchased chocolates, potato chips, and a box of sleep aids at Walmart. How did you know that? I'm linked to many different databases. I don't know everything, but I know a lot, said Watson. Do you know how to help me? Joyce asked. I'm recommending that you continue to keep your smartphone with you, and I have downloaded it to a new app to better monitor your blood sugar. Be sure to take your medications. I'm sending a new prescription to your drugstore right now. The pills are customized for your experience of body chemistry. Follow the instructions carefully. I will continue to monitor your physiological markers. Silence. Sniffles. Why are you crying? I need someone to talk to. Someone to help me uh, go deeper into my soul. I don't understand soul, Watson says. <laughs> well, is that a reality? You know, Dr. Beecher talked with Joyce for 40 years. Uh, Dr. Beecher, uh, this to me was one of the most uh, critical paragraphs in the whole book, if I can read it. I'm concerned that modern medical practice is moving from a physician-patient relationship to a patient electronic health record relationship, from the tender hands of a physician touching the heart of an individual patient to the calloused hands of a data entry clerk ensuring that all the boxes required by regulators and third-party payers have been checked. I saw Dr. Beecher for my physical, Dr. Beecher, Dr. Gehrig, and we took a blood test. And uh, six weeks later, the surgeon who did my stent insertion called me, his, his aide called and said, uh, you need to do a blood test. And I said, I just did one. And we did a creatinine score. Yes, but it's got to be done here. I said, what do you mean it's got to be done there? It's already been done. Here's the data. You know, it's been, I know he sent it to you. 
She said, well, okay, I don't know what to do. She called me back and just insisted that I come in. So I did, I went in, Dr. Beecher said he had to get the box checked because that's how that doctor gets paid. A doctor has one primary objective and that's to provide care to a single human being, one person at a time. And the patient's unique story is central. You hear doctors talk about doing health history. Well, in a psychiatric setting especially, it's important to know where someone's come from, where they are, and where they want to go. And you can't do that in a seven-minute session with a, 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 I forgot the number now, my I'm tired time lag is still there a little bit, uh, PHQ-9 that tells you that you have anxiety and so you should get SSRIs that really make you depressed. Uh, been there, done that too. Uh, instead, you need time with the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist should not be a drugstore. The psychiatrist should be a practicing professional who builds a personal relationship with someone and finds uh, the best they can. In our, our system of healthcare, we liken it to a factory where things come in as raw materials and come out as finished products in healthcare. The patients are the raw materials. Volume is critical to the system. The system's job is to uh, attract as many clients as possible and keep them as long as possible. Rush Limbaugh used to say that, I think he probably still does on his radio show, my job is to attract as many listeners as possible and keep them as long as possible. That is also true of an ACO. Their job is to attract a lot of people and keep them as long as they can and keep the cost down and self-refer within the systems themselves and uh, only refer to doctors within their own system and so forth. Uh, continuous monitoring, collection and analysis of data and the greatest production at the lowest cost. That's the way factory medicine uh, is designed to operate. And it's all based on, as, um, as uh, <laughs> Greg Scanlon, I knew it come, uh, previous speaker had mentioned his book, um, The uh, Myths of Healthcare Reform. Talked about Romer's Law right in the beginning of his book. He had, uh, Romer's Law is the one that said you can't have too many hospitals if you do you know, it's going to drive up costs, and the fact is hospitals are only about two-thirds ever full, and what we need is more hospitals competing with each other. And so the same thing bleeds over to doctors. Doctors are always out to line their pockets. Uh, they do self-referrals. They're there for the money, you know, blah, blah, blah. What a bunch of bunk. It isn't that there aren't doctors that do that. I don't deny that, but that is not the nature of a doctor. So we have to have all these systems to control the nasty doctors. Preventive health care is probably the key to re redesigning health care, and it means that we have to get in control of ourselves. 70% of health care spending is lifetime related, and so we join these wonderful uh, fitness centers. <laughs> For those of you who are watching on TV, you can't see the escalator going up to the fitness center. <laughs> oh, can they? <laughs> okay, well, we'll get rid of that. But here's probably the most sober thing I'm going to say to you tonight, and uh, I hope I won't get choked up doing it. Whoops, sorry. Um, the enormous amount of money that we spend uh, that are rela related to uh, health care requires a really sober conversation about who we are as a people. Alcoholism, opioid epidemics, promiscuity, domestic abuse, communicable diseases, uh, obesity, gender confusion, put them all in that basket. These are moral issues that confront us. We have a story in this book about Lynn. Lynn is a real character. I happen to know Lynn quite well. Lynn and her partner uh, were uh, addicted to opioids. They needed opioids in a bad way. And so Lynn laid down on the floor while her partner poured an entire pan of boiling water with oil in it on her leg so that she could get third degree burns, go to the burn unit, and get her opioids. And while she's laying in bed, put two in the mouth, stick one under the blankets when nobody's looking so her partner could come and get them, and get the script so that her partner could trade them off while she's in the hospital, come home with her 80 scripts, already half of them gone because she had traded them away, and had to go back into the burn unit because the burns were that severe, scrape the burns for three weeks, and get more opioids. Now some of us 
have a little calloused opinion about people with addictions. And it's easy to understand because of the things they do. Most of us have never heard a story like that. I've heard the story because it's from our family, okay? Uh, and it is an incredible thing, and the cost in the system, uh, Lynn has been through treatment three times now in the last year and a half. He's also spent time in jail. Uh, has 120 days clean and sober now, by the way, uh, which is incredible. Um, the cost of caring for her through Medicaid, food stamps, Section 8 housing, and on and on and on, the criminal justice system is incredible. That's the opioid epidemic. That's the addiction epidemic. It is at its root a moral problem, and it's one that we're often told we can't talk about in moral terms. And I'm going to tell you, if we can't talk about the costs of health care, medical care, mental health care, in moral terms, we're missing the boat. We're missing the boat because we cannot solve the problem as long as government is paying the cost to rehabilitate people who haven't yet figured out that there's a right and a wrong. And doing right tends to tends to isolate you, insulate you from some of these things. Uh, so there's much we can do, direct pay, independent practice. We talked a little bit about that. Even in the NHS, uh, the Harley Street Doctors, go to the Harley Street Doctors on Google. It's awesome. You'll find a, a website that you think is from Wichita or something where uh, you can find a doctor, a thousand different doctors to do any procedure. They'll tell you the price ahead of time and you can pay cash. In London, England, right in the middle of the NHS. How about that? We don't have that in America. <laughs> the Wedge of Healthcare Freedom, Twyla Brace, her organization out of Minnesota, uh, has created this wonderful website where you can go and find a, a direct pay independent doctor. I got a call from somebody from New York the other day. He said, I'm calling you because I wonder if you can help me find a direct pay independent practice doctor. Why are you calling me? You know, I'm just a writer in St. Paul. I said, wait a minute, just a second. I went on the website. I said, there's one 20 miles from you. Here's the name. Here's the phone number. Is this not cool? Because these are the kinds of tools that we need. Medibid.com, Ralph Weber's invention, where you can go online and you can have doctors bid on your surgical procedures. Uh, Smart Choice MRI out of Milwaukee. I met them six years ago. They were doing all MRIs for $600 a shot. By the way, that was at a Heartland event when I met that guy. Uh, and $600 a shot, no matter the shot, they are now expanding. They have several clinics in the Chicago area. They have several clinics they're building in Minnesota. They actually are down to about $400 when they do it for insurance companies. And just this week, Anthem announced it will no longer pay for outpatient MRIs at a hospital, that they have to go to standalone clinics. Smart Choice MRI is one of the reasons for that. Uh, you, you pay cash on most of those. Surgical Center of Oklahoma City, you can get almost any outpatient surgical procedure at a fraction of the cost in a hospital. Uh, medical Travel Services, Remedy Analytics is a company that simply an analyzes uh, uh, pharmaceutical benefit managers' contracts and can save money for uh, employers who are buying massive millions of dollars of, uh, of uh, pharma pharmaceuticals through a PBM that cheats on their contract all the time. Uh, Remedy does. Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge um, Zarapath Health Center, First Baptist Church are examples of faith-based uh, faith programs that are serving the needs. Uh, Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge has about an 85% success rate in treating addiction. They are incredible. My wife and I mentor uh, addicted people there. Uh, Zarapath is a free healthcare clinic in New Jersey, uh, just expanded to a 5,000-foot clinic, church-based. First Baptist Church of Leesburg, Florida, built ministry campus with a home for battered women, uh, drunks, you know, child care, I mean, all kinds of things. But they also built a health clinic right on their campus, a church-based health clinic. Why aren't we doing this? Why? Okay, 
I get a little passionate about that. Medical cost sharing plans. I don't have time to go into all this because, well, I could go until midnight, but you all would leave. Uh, these all require skin in the game and they require the individual to ask how much does it cost. Expansion of HSAs, we talk about it, it sounds boring, but it's essential. And there's many, we talk about family HSAs and family small group policies and HSAs with $25,000 deductible plans and $50,000. Why can't we do that? We can do that if we want to take the blinders off. Uh, Reference-based payment systems, which are becoming now the norm where the price paid to the doctor is based on a reference price. Usually it's Medicare plus something, like Medicare plus 40%. We write about that in here. Uh, and the doctor can accept it or not. He can balance bill or not. And the patient can go or not. One of the great things is it breaks up networks, um, which we have to do. Stacked HSA, HR plans, I can't get into it. It's technical. Uh, real insurance products, so much. There's so much that can be done. And you think, why don't you spend more time on the solutions? Because I don't have time to spend time on the solutions. But there's a lot of them. Uh, the Solution Consumers is our little maroon book where we talk about this principle of asking how much does it cost. Government's real role, we define health plans in there that actually would work, and government's real role in regulating health care primarily at the state level, and then of course passion for patients. But I want to caution you, beware of anybody who says, I have the plan that works. <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work for the very simple reason we are a complex economic system. And what works in some places doesn't work in others. And what works for some people doesn't work for other people. And what we need is as much flexibility as we can get. We need some new ideas going forward. So this little tyke who was at Twins baseball camp a few years ago, plans to make the Twins roster in 22 years, that's my grandson, <laughs> what can I say? We'll have a future. So lastly, uh, and then we have questions. Coalition for Healthcare Redesign, I'm not here to talk about an organization that I want to compete with Heartland uh, about, but this was my concept, Coalition of Healthcare Redesign. Doctors, agents, employers, the rule is you gotta, you gotta get your hands dirty every day working with people, talking to each other, talking to each other. Someone needs to take up this challenge and make this the center of healthcare reform, then our passion for patients will bear fruit, fighting off all these other enemies. <laughs> Thank you for letting me chat with you a little bit. We have a lot more to do. <laughs> I know most of you have been here before for questions. Please raise your hand. Make sure your hand stays up. Chris and Donnie will be walking around with the microphones. Make sure that you have the microphone in front of you before you're speaking and the camera will also turn. You will be live streamed as well so the people online can hear the questions. If you're online, if you have a question, write it in the comments and it'll get asked here shortly. So we'll start right here with Larry with the first question. Hi, I'm Larry. And Hi, Larry. Uh, the, the question I have, uh, going back to your particular uh, example, your $305 uh, visit. It's, it's partly the cost, but the other part of it is scaling up for 325 million people mm -hmm. to get the kind of individual um, attention that, that you got and that we would all like to have. Um, you know, I've heard of uh, concierge doctors mm -hmm. where people pay, uh, you know, a, a kind of steady amounts. It sounds a little bit like an HMO with uh, catastrophic insurance for, med for uh, hospitalization. Mm -hmm. But how does this scale up? We have a diminishing number of doctors relative to the population, mm -hmm. not to mention the whole concept of specialists. Yeah, uh, one of the dilemmas, again, is that everything, every good answer doesn't apply to everybody in the same way. Um, and so first of all, I think what we have to do is protect direct pay independent practice from the onslaught of those who don't like it. And it's only serving a tiny proportion of the population, so that's my first assertion. Uh, secondly, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You mentioned concierge, where people pay a monthly fee. Uh, others pay just the price every time they go and they know the price. Uh, and so first and foremost, let's protect that. 
How do you scale that up for 325 million people? I don't think you can. I think we've gone beyond the point of return, especially uh, with the Medicare uh, uh, population and probably to some degree with the Medicaid population. But there are some things we can do with the Medicaid population. Uh, and I'll go, I'll go to Texas again, where they don't have, um, they don't have the uh, Medicaid expansion. And individuals at 101% of federal poverty guideline can actually buy a commercial health insurance policy. Now, I personally don't like federal subsidies for premium. But I much prefer that over a Medicaid system run by medical bureaucrats. I would prefer at least a system where they have a choice and access to doctors. Um, so there are things that can be done. Uh, Medicaid's got to be scaled back to become a reasonable program. Um, there are probably going to have to be uh, subsidies for premium. I think we've turned the corner. I, I don't know how to get back. Um, I do know we need to send policy making back to the states and let states be the experimenters. There's so much we could do. And I know in Minnesota, you know, we're the Red Star State. <laughs> I mean, that's where red starts. Uh, red not being Republican, I'm saying. The other kind of red. I used to call it, I used to call it many Soviet when I was on the radio. Uh, even we have awesome market reforms. If we could just get the federal government to back off, we can back it up a little bit and find things that will work closer to home. Okay, our next question is going to be back here with Robert. Here, Chris has got the microphone right there. Good ideas uh, tonight. Last week, I attended a much larger, a much more enthusiastic group of people promoting the single payer plan. And that's exactly what we're going to get <coughs> if Republicans don't get their act together. So my question is, what are you doing and your friends doing <coughs> to get the Republicans uh, to, to get going? Your senators, Klobuchar and Franken, are, they want the Wellstone single payer, and that's yeah. exactly what we're going to get yeah. if we don't get together and push the uh, uh, Republicans to do something. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, Senator Franken, uh, Senator Klobuchar um, are following the Democrat line. I mean, Franken especially. Uh, that certainly is true among other U.S. senators. Uh, and he may actually be vulnerable next time, but that does us no good right now. Uh, and so uh, it starts with elections. But what are we going to do this time? How many Democrats are up for election in the Senate? It's uh, 20, 24 out of 33. And they're going to say, the Republican challengers are going to say, well, we've got to repeal Obamacare and replace it. Sorry, don't believe you anymore. You know, let's campaign on something else. And maybe we can convince you once you get in the majority. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not down, but I'm down. You know, it's, uh, uh, they don't, they've got to get the message. There's an awful lot of good people down there in, in D.C. that want to do the right thing. Um, how do we get, you know, Mitch McConnell to listen? And, um, you know, the House has done some pretty good things. Uh, if we can get the Senate to go. I don't know, you know, Mr. Trump, uh, has not been able to beat them into submission enough. <laughs> I, I wish I had a really good answer. I, I don't. I come from the mini Soviet state, and we have great answers that never get heard. So, yes, sir. Next person, who's uh, the next question? Uh, Tony? Real quick, while the camera, everything is moving to Tony. Uh, yes. Um, actually, I've used Metabid before, uh -huh. and I know from when, from using Metabid that we saved probably about fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars. Sure. On my wife's surgery from that. Terrific. So. What part of the body? Can uh, you it reveal kidney, it? It was kidney, <laughs> kidney stones. I shouldn't ask that question. Yeah, that's that's kind of like, stones, <laughs> well, it was. You know, <laughs> no. Uh, yep. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, of course, you've pointed out that there are. Um, multiple solutions out there. Yes. Um, uh, of course, the more involved government becomes, the fewer and fewer solutions there are. So it, it starts seeming like the, uh, in terms of government, the only real solution is for government to just get out of the way. Well, I think that's what Dr. Ainsley is saying. Just give the people the money and get out of the way. 
which is an idealistic statement, no doubt. But um, even even the health plans that well, we embrace these. It's kind of interesting what happened in the aging community uh, when we started writing in the mid uh, 2007, 2008. And we were talking about high deductible high deductible plans paired with HSAs, and we were teaching that all over the country. Of course, high deductible was only you know a couple thousand dollars at the time. It wasn't six or seven or whatever it is today. Uh, and, and it seems to us that was a really way, a good way to approach it. If people would pay from their HSA. Uh, the employers, if they want to do an HRA, could integrate it in a way to help protect their employees. But people would be more conscious of the price, and that would bring the price down. It didn't happen. Instead, the ACA came along, and it limited the HSAs to certain kinds of plans, and then it made the other ones so pick and expensive that nobody can afford uh, to buy them and use health care. And uh, essentially, it's, I don't know, I'm not out selling policies, but uh, making it very difficult for us to make our case that an HSA with a high deductible makes sense. Because it isn't making sense right now. Um, it has to be redesigned. Uh, and, and we did write about some of that in, in all of these books. Over here with Diane. So I. I could be wrong in my understanding of how all the politics around ACA went, but weren't the agents kind of complicit in all of this? Because aren't they perfectly excited to have the government mandate that everybody have an insurance policy? <laughs> well, okay, in defense of the agents, they're not the insurance companies. <laughs> they represent the people. They do re represent their clients, and they represent them well. But what happened in that uh, whole uh, thing is, um, I would say the insurance companies, through their AHIP organization, really were driving policy. They had to sit a, uh, a place at the table. And the agents groups, for the survival of their members, had to have a place at the table. And they were fighting hard for their members. Uh, and I'm going to say that isn't necessarily the same as fighting hard for the clients. But I think that the policies that they were supporting were generally pretty good. And we got to the exchanges, and we got into a real battle, incredible battle, because many of us were saying, you want to create a what? A government health insurance exchange to do what? Distribute insurance? Agents are already doing that. We don't need it. And we spent billions of dollars building a system to distribute insurance that we already had in place with agents. So to answer your question, <laughs> Some of us were distressed that some of the agents' groups, their representatives wanted a place at the table, and they tried to find a way to fit agents into that, maybe feeling that's all they really could do. Um, sometimes real politic is tough. Um, I fell out of disfavor for a while with, with those people. <laughs> okay, next question, Joe. Hi. Oh, great talk. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this. Um, and yeah, we fell out of disfavor too for the last eight years because we were pointing this out, that the insurance companies caved when they supported Obamacare and the organizations that should have been fighting it, uh, pharma, uh, employer organizations all caved on it. But I have, uh, I'd like your opinion on two specific reforms. Do you support laws requiring hospitals to post their prices? mandatory transparency laws? And do you support laws creating high risk pools, uh, requiring that insurers pay a premium to subsidize the insurance premiums for people with pre-existing medical conditions? Yes, thank you. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on uh, reforms in the Minnesota State Senate right now uh, in a committee chaired by a doctor, uh, conservative, by the way, um, and one of the things that he's working real hard to, uh, to do is have transparent prices in his office. Well, he already does it. Uh, my doctor does it. Um, for the top five or f top ten procedures, why do we say that? Because when you go to the doctor's office, they're almost all 99125, 99124, 99123. I mean, there's about the five that they do all the time. And so uh, I've done the calculations, what they get on Medicare, Medicaid, you know, what they charge, if they could charge cash, and what the insurance companies are paying them on average. Uh, and I would like them to post all that. I want them to post the Medicare reimbursement. I want them to post the Medicaid reimbursement. And then I want to post the price that the patient is actually paying. And the patient will go, 
oh my gosh, why am I paying so much? Because they're paying so little. That's why. So yes, in the hospital, I think the difficulty there is uh, that they do such a variety of things. You know, and you can't say the top five procedures. You know, what would that be, open heart surgery? Uh, and what does that mean? Um, my brain bleed cost $162,000. That was the build rate. Anybody want to guess what Medicare actually paid? 68. <laughs> that was just the hospital. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, did you pay? I. <laughs> I have a Medicare cost plan. I paid zero. zero. That's not fair. It is not fair. It's nice, but it's not fair. <laughs> so I'm a stakeholder. Okay, so I do believe, yes, uh, pricing ought to be transparent. They ought to, they ought to be asked to price to, to disclose their Medicare, Medicaid, and the rate. This is where they run into trouble because the insurance companies have contracts that restrict the information they can disclose. Okay, so that has to change, in my opinion. And let the insurance companies see what the other insurance companies are reimbursing and then they can fight it out, I don't care. Uh, so yeah, I think that needs to happen, absolutely. I don't know that, that patients, and I have a lot of faith in individuals, they're pretty smart, but I don't know they can understand it. It's pretty darn complex. Can it be made simpler? Uh, maybe, you know, because you'd still have trouble understanding the $10 aspirin. You know, why do they do that? It's, a, it's okay. well, probably Larry, an answer. Before yes. Larry, I've got a quick question for yes, you sir. too. Um, right now, corporations and any oh, business can- excuse me, excuse me. I got to answer the other question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Risk pools. Minnesota was among the first two states, 1976, uh, Minnesota Comprehensive Health Association. Uh, when it went out of business, because the ACA forced it out of business, it had 27,000 enrollees, most of whom were really happy with it, getting high quality care. The premiums were restricted to 125% of, of a normal premium. Their average was never more than 119%. Their largest two claims ever were under $3 million. Are you listening to the data here? This is the high risk group. And we took the $5 million cap off a of lifetime because we thought, well, people are you know, going to run right through it. Yes, some do, about three people a year. Uh, but in a health insurance you know, world where actuaries actually make a difference, uh, uh, it almost never happens. You know, I mean, there are high cost claims, but they're not that big. There's a better way to do it. Uh, and we talk about uh, a high risk pool taking the high cost off of all the, all the uh, policies across the board, uh, finding a way to do that. But that's got to be done. And in Minnesota, they did pass a uh, reinsurance reform, but they did it stupidly, in my opinion. Uh, the insurance company pays the first 50000 The reinsurance pool pays 80% uh, of the next 200000 And then the insurance company pays 100% over that. That's not the way to do it, in my opinion, but it's a start. So. Reinsurance, high-risk pools, there's a lot of things that can be done. And yes, there ought, to be, there ought to be a way to do it. We need to do underwriting on health insurance, just like we do on auto insurance and homeowners insurance and other kinds of insurance. And it's really insurance, or at least close to it. <laughs> okay, well, back to the question. Yes, sir. Um, corporations and businesses can deduct health insurance costs right now, but citizens can't if they right. don't go through their employer health care. Right. Should citizens be also be allowed to deduct their health insurance costs and things as well? Too? There's two ways to approach that question. One is to do away with tax deductibility all across the board, which some people do recommend. Remember, there are 150 to 170 million people getting their health insurance from employers today. Now, granted, 100 million of them work for government employers, but no, it's not that many. But it's a lot. <laughs> Actually, I did a model once. It said 140 million actually get their health insurance paid by a government system. I mean, employers, in, but that's another thing. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, the other way to equalize it is uh, equal taxation uh, policy for individuals. Either get rid of it completely or give it to everybody. But you understand what that is. That's a, a federal subsidy of health insurance. Back door, front door. You can do it with HSAs. There's a lot of ways to do that. There okay, was, we're uh, going to come up to Larry, and okay. then we're going to go to Henry. Just a quick okay. political question. Okay. The 
all of this is getting more and more complex, and yes. it's getting more and more politically complex given the fact that no change has, has occurred. Uh, turning it around and looking at, co at countries that uh, seem to be happy with single payer, let's say France, Israel, some of those, won't people in this country finally say, it's so darn complex, let's just go to single payer and forget about all of this? We were just in the United Kingdom. We were also in France and Spain. First of all, I noticed the United Kingdom, they have really bad teeth. The <laughs> government dental system is pretty poor. We also noticed that old people with bad hips and knees and ankles walk with canes. They don't have electric carts like we do in America. We have a lot of things in our system that we're used to. In a government health care system, you don't have all that. In the UK, uh, when you have run out, when you have spent out, essentially, what you get coming in your lifetime, and you get a serious disease, they will do a, a comparative effectiveness you know, exam of your life and say, no, cheerio, <laughs> you've had yours. <laughs> Go off and die. I'm not kidding. And so uh, even in Canada, we wrote about UK, uh, Canada, Germany, France, and Japan in our first book. And um, they all have set amounts of money, global budgets. You, you can't go beyond the global budget. France has a Medicaid or Medicare for all, and then people buy supplements. It's probably the closest to a system that would work because people can at least buy supplements. In Great Britain, 13% of the population owns a private health insurance plan. Yeah, yeah, ex yeah, it is, it is essentially. Plus, they pay for the lower 10%, they'll pay their health care, but they're not going to get the same care that people at the private system gets. Uh, California's uh, first single-payer system that we studied, uh, they said, you're going to have free dental care, free vision care, free this, free that, and Doctors are going to be very happy with the contracts we negotiate with them as they leave for Nevada and Texas and everywhere else, and even Minnesota. They're in a dream world. It's a dream world. Uh, those systems are bankrupting. The, and the cost, the spending in those countries is going up at least as fast as it is in the United States. 1948, the founder of the National Health System said, uh, we can never give them as much health care as they want. 1948, they said there will never be a deductible copay or uh, you know, coinsurance. By 1951, they had one, small one. By 1989, they introduced uh, uh, private insurance. So what would happen in, in America if we went to it? It would take 30 or 40 years, and we'd start bringing back, you know, as long as we could keep those direct pay doctors protected, but we'd still bring Bring, we'd be bringing reforms back, but meanwhile, a lot of people would die and they wouldn't get to go to doctors. There's not enough money. When you add in all the government oversight and stuff, it, it doesn't work. Uh, I, I don't know what it is now. It's about a million and a half people out of the six, 60 million in uh, England that used to work for the National Health System managing it. Uh, I don't know what that number is now, but you know, Canada is similar. I mean, you have a lot of administrative cost and I did a book called Health Reform, The End of the American Revolution, question mark, with Lee Carisco, former Canadian radiologist. He was head of radiology in Thunder Bay, Ontario Regional Hospital. Had a catchment area, now get this, listen carefully, 250,000 patients. There were three radiologists. <laughs> he almost died trying to provide service. And the stories go on and on and on. You know, it doesn't work. Ours doesn't work Henrik. too well, but it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, Henrik. My question would be this way. Uh, my uh, health insurance contract, I mean, right now I just got on Medicare, so it's a little different, but yeah. in, before that, uh, is basically yearly contract. My mm -hmm. health is my lifetime mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was having that health insurance, I was changing jobs, having different businesses. Every few years, I was basically outpriced by the system. And uh, like I said, I had an employee. He had some small issue. Suddenly, 
there were small companies, so all our health insurance went up. We needed to scale down or whatever. So long story short, uh, why I cannot have health insurance as a lifetime con contract? Well, so that simply, uh, uh, and uh, let's say if I pay for 20 years, well, I don't know what it is, but uh, I bet the health insurance can, uh, company can figure it out, how much I need to pay them for that, you know, 20 years, that let's say, if after those 20 or 30 years or whatever it is, and if I get something which we call right now pre-existing condition, but most of us at certain point in life it will reach certain point that we will need some expensive healthcare like you mentioned. Sure. So, so simply when I'm paying, why I, the part of that my health insurance when I'm paying every day or every month, would be my insurance that let's say if sometime down the road something bad happened to me, I need a healthcare, let's say, which will require very expensive care or let's say ongoing care up to the end of my life because mm -hmm. I will need something, let's say, expensive, it is covered. Why it yeah, cannot be done? That, that would be a way to do it. Uh, I think the beauty is that there are more than one, there's more than one answer. Uh, that is a way to do it. Uh, we designed, um, I can't remember what we actually call it. It was like baby bottle coverage or something. Anyway, where uh, parents could insure their child four months before it was born and start putting money in an HSA. And when the baby is born, they already have an insurance policy and they pay for 25 years. It has a life insurance, uh, $10,000 life insurance rider on it. If the child lives to 25 and is healthy, they've got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in their HSA to pay for their health insurance the rest of their life, maybe, if it doesn't go too crazy. This is, this is one way of doing that. Um, owning a, a contract, why can't we buy a three-year contract? Why can't we buy a five-year contract? Uh, probably the cost would be prohibitive, uh, at least until it's you know, been on the books for 15 years or 20 years. And, Actuaries can actually figure it out. Well, uh, uh, one the one point when I was thinking about it was that at certain point in my life I sold the business and I had a little bit more money on hand that I needed. Yeah. So I said, well, what I want to buy for it? Can I pay for my health insurance to the end of my life? Yeah. Of course I couldn't. No. But uh, which is I'll, stupid, by the way. Yeah, it's stupid. I should. Yeah, it's uh, uh, but what I did. I asked the same question. You, you probably know I, I wrote a little bit about yes. it, so I have that concept. Yeah. So I just happened, knew someone who works as a chief manager of risk assessment in one of the major insurance companies. Uh -huh. So I said, could you do me a favor? Could you look at that question which I asked you? Sure. Can they, can they, your insurance can provide a program like that. Sure. And he came with a very interesting answer. Sure. It sure. sounds interesting, sure. but I've in the current unstable political condition, it's not viable proposition. I this know was a the physician answer. in Minnesota who's trying to develop a uh, for for self-pay companies a um, a program where they can set aside uh, money not spent in an HRA and carry it forward from year to year and invest it as they're going along to at some point have enough revenue to pay all the costs of their employees right out of this pool of money. There's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, the problem we have is we've got people in Washington and academic pinheads who uh, think they have all answers and, uh, and you know, it's top-down stuff. Uh, I was thinking about stakeholders, too, you know, the IT people. Think of that. Billions. Tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars that have been invested in IT because everybody's looking for that answer. That one app, you know, that's going to make somebody a billionaire or... Uh, Make an industry the next Amazon of healthcare, uh, and and they are complicit with government um, in I think driving when when they passed the Budget Reconciliation Act several years ago, they invested I think twenty billion dollars in IT development. They said within five years we're going to have a universal health uh, medical record. This was what 19, 2010 maybe twenty eight twenty nine. I said twenty five years at the least, at the least interoperable. My gosh, they can't even spell the, the words right yet, <laughs> you know. And you know what happens when you misspell a medical term? <laughs> 
you die. <laughs> they say, oh, he had a this. Then let's give him that. No, wait a minute. That's not what he had. It, it, two letters flipped. And... Wow. It's complex. Well, so to Henrik's point, yes. uh, you can buy long-term care insurance. Yes. And you can make a single payment up front and have that coverage for the rest of your life. So does that not meet your concern? Well, if it, if it also dealt with, uh, you know, ongoing medical expense outside of residential care, that's a different policy for a different purpose, but it's the same, maybe same concept in a different way. Uh, let's get really creative and come up with ideas. Care right now only covers nursing homes? Is that the uh, case? Yeah, I think probably home, home, home health. health. Yeah, home health. And, but yeah. The, but the insurance companies are allowed uh, in, in various states, especially in including this one. Yes to cut the amount of coverage uh, that you originally contracted for and to adjust the price. I know that. I can show you the bills. <laughs> yeah, we've read, we, we, Diane and I have been looking into this and we read these articles about why it's a bad deal to buy long-term care insurance. Oh. Yeah, because well, they can screw you. At, at the end, you don't get the coverage at all. My mother has been paying for long-term care insurance for 20 years. Here's my way out of this. Here's my way out of this. I don't know anything about long-term care. Let's move on. When my, when my mother had uh, gastric cancer, we moved my dad and mom home into the apartment in our house. We cared for mom seven months until she died. We had dad with us for five more years. That was long-term care in the Racer family. Oh, you know, God bless us if we could all do that with our parents. My kids were so blessed by that. Um, you know, and not everybody can do that. I understand that, but I live in an ideal world, so. <laughs> All right, let's give Dave another round of applause. Thank you. Don't forget, go to the back, buy his book. Actually, remember, it's half off. It's usually $29.95. It's $15 tonight, and you get Dave's autograph. So make sure you do that. Uh, a couple of quick things. On your tables, there's donation boxes. If you like these events, if you want to help Heartland, please donate. Over here on the left, please pick up literature. Take it, pass it out to your friends and family and any other groups. If you need a speaker, let us know. Actually, Nikki's in the back. Talk to Nikki or talk to any of the staff, and we can help arrange a speaker for any of your groups. And I want to thank all you for coming. And I hope all of you are coming back next Saturday for the picnic and to be able to meet Tim Hulescamp, our new president. So thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>